Hello, and welcome to the talk uh, about fully automated VMware migration to OpenNibula. My name is Neil Hansen. I am a senior cloud solutions architect here at OpenNibula. Uh, I've got roughly 10 years of experience in the, in the cloud architecture field. And I'm here to talk to you about a tool that we've been working on over the past couple months called OneSwap. And it's a, it's a tool that we can provide uh, to you guys to do some automatic migrations from VMware over to Open Nebula. Um, you can see the link here to the public repository where you can access it right now. Uh, you can get cutting edge updates there. Any new releases will be there as well. And since it's an open source tool here, uh, we, we do welcome any uh, reports of bugs or any uh, new features that could be useful. Uh, created into the in the issues area. There's also a full wiki there to describe uh, a lot more of this in, in much more detail on how to use it and what the prerequisites are and, and everything like that. Um, and yeah, it's a fully open source tool for converting vCenter VMs over to Open Nebula with uh, relatively little input. Uh, it does support both Linux and Windows guests, so you can convert either one. Um, Almost every single distribution is supported by, uh, we utilize Vert B2B for the conversion, so most, most operating systems are supported by them. Um, we do have a fallback conversion system that will just simply convert the image over from the VMDK format over to QCOW2 format if, if nothing else works. And then you can do some manual, manual fixes there to finish up that. That's a edge case, and most of the time, things will be automatic, automatically able to convert. Additionally, we offer the ability to install guest packages. So this is open Nebula contextualization packages for your network configuration once the VM boots up in its new, new, new place. And uh, we can also install Vertio drivers if the, uh, especially for Windows, for it to utilize Vertio devices on KVM systems once it boots up. I also do like QMU guest agent and stuff is available there as well. Um, optionally, we, you can also have it create the MAC address and the IP address uh, that is listed in vCenter for the virtual machine in Open Nebula. Um, there's options to skip these, of course, if you don't want it to have the same exact hardware ID and IP address and everything. But if you do want to retain the same kind of network structure, then that uh, ability is there. Um, and with that, we have a configuration file. Um, since there's so many options in this, instead of having to put in 20 command line parameters, uh, we just have a, a configuration file. And that configuration file is overridden by the command line parameters. So you can use it as almost like a default template for your conversions as you go through. Um, and just it utilizes some uh, nice, well developed open source tools, such as libguestfs, where the vert v2v and everything comes from, and vert customize. There's a couple of tools in there we use. And we use the rbv mommy2 API, it's the, the Ruby uh, wrapper for, for vSphere API. There's some excerpts from the conversion file. It's not the entire thing, but just some some key points here to show the uh, HTTP transfer um, because it's possible to run this script on a different machine from the OpenAPI front end. Uh, you can provide the uh, information about this server into the HTTP area, and it'll uh, tell OpenNebula front end server to download from it rather than having to copy the files directly over there and everything. A couple transfer options here. Um, which is kind of like there's that custom convert when I, I mentioned earlier that does the, the basic conversion um, of the VMDK format to QCOW2 format. We also have the hybrid uh, format, which uses RBB Momies to RBB Momies 2's download to convert uh, to download the images locally and then do the conversion locally as well. Uh, traditionally, it'll do the conversion using an uh, NBD kit. Uh, so it does it over the network, and depending on how far away your vCenter is from your OpenNebula server or whatever, that can be more, much more time consuming than just downloading the image and doing it locally. And you'll see some network and some data store options of like where to place uh, these, these network and data store or images that get created, and an option to skip the IP and Mac. On the right side, there's some uh, vert V2B extra options that will uh, tell you if, if you need like a separate working directory or something rather than TMP. Uh, maybe you want to do raw instead of QCOW2 format for some reason. Um, and then also the VDDK, the vCenter's uh, disk development kit. Um, uh, that can be, it means to speed up um, the image transfer 
when not utilizing the hybrid mode. And also if we should install the guest agent and if there's a vert IO path direct, and then if there's um, if there's a custom like vert B2B build that you that you'd like to use instead of the one uh, that's provided. Um, Ubuntu 24.04 should have all the, the necessary versions of everything though. So. And there's some example I put just to show you kind of what to expect when you run it. In the top, you'll see the download section. This is using the hybrid mode. So it downloads the image first, and then it builds a small uh, libvirt XML file and converts the, the images locally this way. Um, you can see the green section there is the vert B2B output. And those are color coded. The, the yellow ones will be warnings. And if there are any errors, they'll show up in red as well. After that's done, the it'll inspect the disk locally to just see see what's on there, make sure everything looks good. Uh, then it'll open up the HTTP server and have open Nebula front end download the image from the server over to there and create the image. Once that's done, it'll add network, in, network interfaces to the template. Um, Check for any other configurations that are necessary there, and then it'll it'll create the template, and it should spit out the the template ID at the end there. Uh, at the bottom, you'll see some delete entries. Um, optionally, you can have it delete the files by default. It'll leave them there just in case there's something something goes wrong or anything you want to inspect the the files, and it'll show you where they're at. And then um, it'll automatically delete any password files as well. It has to use like some password files to do some some of the authentication there. And those will always be deleted no matter what. And that's that's essentially uh, the OneSwap tool. Um, there's there's a lot of more parameters you can read about in the in the GitHub repository, and I definitely welcome you to go look at that. Um, if you see any new features that you'd like implemented, go and report an issue. You're also welcome to take a fork and develop yourself and submit a uh, pull request and that we'll review, do some testing on, and make sure that it works. But this is a a fully open source tool. We, we welcome the community to work with us in. And that, that ends my section, but I'm going to pass this off over to Bradley now from Encore Technologies so he can talk uh, a bit about his experience using the tool um, and some of the some of the interesting stuff that they've built around the tool as well to, to help with further automation. Thank you. Hey, thanks, Neil. Um, so I'm Brad Bishop. DevOps manager at Encore Technologies, been with Encore for about 10 years, um, always doing automation. Uh, Encore specializes in being an MSP for our partners and will come in and do automated solutions to fit your needs. This is our automation stack, um, kind of general here, but uh, all of our customers interact with our automation through ServiceNow. We have an automation platform, uh, which is an app called Stackstorm. And then from Stackstorm, we can integrate with many different apps, uh, different hypervisors, physical, cloud, you name it. Uh, it really enables us to talk to all of these platforms and uh, do it in a way that's uh, really easy to use and uh, extendable, which is kind of how we got here. Um, so we've uh, spent a lot of time investing in Stackstorm. We like it because it's completely open source, a uh, good tool for automation and integrations. Um, it's an if this, then that workflow engine has event driven uh, actions as well as chat ops. Um, has a uh, community that's really active. They even have a pack exchange, um, which the link is here in the uh, doc. And um, the API and um, everything works together, as you can see in my graphic here. So at the end of the day, everything uses the API. So whether you're submitting API calls from, say, ServiceNow or integrating on the command line or with the web UI, everything works the same. Um, you can uh, and permissions are really good as well. So, you know, for chat ops, if you want certain actions to be in chat ops, but other people to be able to execute from the command line, that's all available to you really makes it easy to enable different people to do different things. Um, and like I showed in the last slide, uh, it's incredibly extensible. So uh, if the client has an API, an executable, really anything, as long as we can get access to it, um, you can use it. We've even done some web scraping stuff in the past. Um, 
it really lets you kind of work within the bounds of your framework, working in a data center. You know, a lot of the technology is really old and uh, has to be interacted with over Modbus or SNMP, something like that. Uh, we can do all of that with one platform, which is why we chose it. Um, we're very active in the community, as you guys will see moving forward. Uh, we maintain and push forward several open source packs, um, which are basically you can think about in, as integrations. Um, things like VMware and obviously Open Nebula, which is why we're here. All those things are, you know, um, integrations that Encore has developed in uh, open source, and we continue to push those forward. So um, first thing, when we chose Open Nebula after we went through kind of our initial rundown of choosing uh, VMware replacements, we were a partner with VMware, um, like many people, and, you know, got kicked out of that partner program and cost skyrocketed. So we decided, uh, given our expertise and all that, that we could probably uh, go somewhere else. And after evaluating about nine different platforms for about six months, um, we ultimately chose Open Nebula. Um, we liked Open Nebula a lot. We liked uh, that it had both supported and open source, um, and we were able to communicate and all those things. So we immediately started developing our open source StackStorm pack, which, like I said, is an integration. Completely open source, maintained by Encore, has about 44 automated actions and workflows, and we're actively building out the things that we see. Um, so a lot of things we do intend on completing the pack and representing the entire API there. Um, but as we add actions, we're doing things like instantiating VMs from templates, uh, updating information on the templates, different settings, uh, looking at images, migrations, that type of thing, um, basically enabling automation through StackStorm. We're using the same XML APIs for the most part as the application is using. We do bank on the Python API every now and again because it does make some things easy. Um, and while StackStorm can work with really any language as long as it can be executed on the system, um, they do have kind of a first class support for Python. It's uh, absolutely built in. Um, so that's where we started and we started adding automation as we learned uh, the platform. We are also able through StackStorm to add uh, kind of some lower level uh, automation, such as doing things with KVM, like uh, doing external snapshots um, for secure boot purposes and things like that. Um, so all of those things are uh, available now at the link above. We will be rolling this into the pack exchange uh, from StackStorm, um, but we are just actively building it out and want to get a little bit further before we push it out there. That being said, it is out there, it is available, um, and anybody can go and use that to uh, push forward your automation. Now, as uh, Neil was showing earlier, we needed to do our migrations, um, and one swap made a lot of sense. A uh, very well-built app uh, was very quick, we demoed three different ways of doing migrations. One was one swap. Uh, two others were doing Veeam backups out of VMware and then doing manual restores on uh, Open Nebula, and then also just converting the disks ourselves. Uh, we have a pretty robust Linux team internal at Encore, and uh, you know we're able to get basically what Neil was doing in the script, kind of doing it manually. Um, the manual was a lot of heavy lifting, would have taken my engineers a lot of time. It would have been very hands-on. Um, the Veeam did work. It was much more hands-on, but um, did work and worked well. We, it was repeatable, but it was slower than the one swap. Um, and we had a lot of a lot of systems to do. So, you know, thinking through that, once we uh, realized one swap, started talking to Neil, got things working for uh, our stuff internally, you know, we started thinking about what what do you need when you're doing a migration, especially if you want it to be fully automated. Um, well, I need the ability to skip certain VMs. Obviously, a migration of this size, um, we have about 150 VMs in the environment that we started with. Um, a migration of that size is not a single day thing. Um, and I don't particularly like to make my engineers work outside of hours. So, you know, we were really targeting business hours for this. Um, so 
we know that this is going to be a multiple day thing. So we uh, use tags to make it so that we wouldn't do uh, VMs that we weren't expecting to do. So for example, if I did my primary um, DC uh, R domain controller, I don't want to do the backup at the same time. Um, you know, that would be bad. The systems have to be down while we're migrating and all that stuff. So we used uh, VMware tags to to stop that migration. And then, you know, when we did the primary, the next day we just took the tag off and the secondary went and it uh, worked out really well. We need to verify that the VM is a good candidate for the migration. Um, at Encore, that was things like having secure boot enabled, uh, no snapshots on the VM, um, is the firmware right? Um, all of those things. Um, so, you know, we wanted automated checks to make sure we weren't migrating things that weren't supposed to be migrated. Um, and we tried to keep our uh, pool small. So, you know, for a couple of days, we did Linux VMs, and then a couple more days, we did Windows VMs. And those, uh, those things were similar, but were a little different as well on what was needed. Uh, we want to make sure that we alert app owners when the VM starts and finishes its migrations. Obviously, when uh, the migration starts, the app's going to be down. We don't want a bunch of incidents um, showing up that uh, VMs are down when that's expected. So we use Slack internally. So we wanted to alert people in Slack uh, with chat ops to make sure that... Um, they knew things were happening. We also could have done email, but for us, uh, Slack was uh, an easy choice. Um, we also want to keep a running list of migrations that are active. So uh, we were targeting running three um, three migrations at a time. Um, and I wanted to know at any given time what VMs were being migrated, just in case I did get asked. Um, and that's different than the notification that goes out to the app owner. I want to make sure that there is just a running list of things that I can see. Um, one swap, you know, does the um, does the conversion and gets the template set up. But um, if it's completely no touch, I need to instantiate that VM um, when it comes up, and that's where you know using the Stackstorm Open Nebula pack uh, comes in handy. And then we need to ensure the system is online and that the migration was successful. A bunch of different ways you can do that. Um, we ultimately chose to just ping the system. We found if it responded to ping that everything else seemed to be working. Um, we did have conversations and built out workflows to go deeper than that, trying to SSH into Windows VMs or WinRM, in, or I'm sorry, SSH into Linux and uh, WinRM into Windows VMs uh, to make sure that you could get in there, run a simple command, uh, that type of thing. And worst case scenario, notify the engineering teams if there are any problems. Um, you know, this is supposed to be hands off. So the engineering teams were on alert that this was happening. They obviously knew, um, but they have their day jobs, right? You know, they have normal project work, uh, keeping, keeping the other systems moving, all of that type of stuff. So I only want them to be engaged if there's a problem. And then if there is a problem, you know, we need to fix it now. So those notifications need to be right away, need to be in Slack, and they need to happen immediately. So how do we get there? So uh, this is a uh, illustration that Stackstorm, the web UI produces. This is truly our workflow that we used. Uh, this will do, this will take a single VM from start to finish all the way through the migration. You can see several starts here. So, you know, we get some information from vSphere um, and this is using, you know, the vSphere open source pack that we maintain, but is out there. Um, we did some versioning information to know what system was happening. Like I said, you know, we did Linux one day, Windows the other. So we did some stuff there to make sure the checks, um, check for the tags, like I mentioned, um, and go through each step. You can see, you know, we're sending some chat ops here, um, getting some more uh, VN info type things. Um, and ultimately, once you get past all that, we run the one swap script. Um, like I said, uh, as long as you can get to a command line, you can run any command that there. So we actually go right to the Sunstone server, 
execute this command and wait for it to finish. Um, Stackstorm is interactive, so it will wait for it to finish and get all of that data back. Um, you can use Python for these types of things as well. Um, so you have a couple different ways to do it. Um, once we're done with that, you know, I need to get the template ID that was just created. I want to instantiate it. And then, like I said, you know, we're going to run our ping check to make sure that everything is working correctly. And then if it uh, is working, you know, we're going to send the final uh, chat ops message that everything's done. And if it errors, I'm going to send the error message. I'm not going to tell the engineer or I'm sorry, I'm not going to tell the app owner that the migration is finished until after the engineer is doing his work. And uh, that's on him if there is an error. Um, so, you know, if there is an error, we didn't want to stop the migrations. We saw a very low error percentage. Um, so we didn't want to stop migrations. The expectation was that the engineers would handle the error, bring the system back online. Um, and if worst case scenario, they couldn't bring it back online, um, they could always turn it off and turn the copy that was still sitting in VMware back online and, you know, we could come back to it the next day. But the expectation was that they were fixing the errors as it happened since we were, we were seeing so few of them. But this is great and all, you know, this works really well for us, but this will only work for one VM at a time. And like I told you all, you know, we needed to do three because we had a big environment we needed to move. Um, <clears throat> luckily with Stackstorm, that's really easy to do. We wrapped all that into a single workflow, like I said, and we just call that workflow in a parent and we can execute that with several things. You see, you can see the little one here. Uh, that's just for this purpose to say that it will let one concurrent action go at the same time. We set that as three and that seemed to work well for us. Um, that allowed, uh, that did not impact the Sunstone server enough that uh, we couldn't do, you know, day-to-day -day type tasks, uh, troubleshooting, this, that, and the other. Um, and also, if we had things that ran longer than others, uh, we did not see impacts on the Sunstone server, which was the goal. You know, do this in a non-impactful way um, with as little errors as possible. And, uh, you know, kind of wrapping everything up, how did we do? So we saw a 96% success rate moving VMs. Uh, the ones that failed were, you know, outside of one swap, you know, because we were actively making changes, adding hosts as we were going. Um, we did not uh, build out a uh, new environment for this. Uh, I took hosts from the VMware environment, imaged them, and added them to the Open Nebula environment as migrations were happening um, so that we didn't have to purchase a lot of hardware. Um, so, you know, we wanted to do this for as uh, least costly as possible. So, you know, things would get put on the wrong uh, hypervisors during instantiation and stuff like that uh, was not a fault of the one swap or, you know, networking things. Sometimes things don't copy over this, that, and the other. Um, our migrations took anywhere between 30 minutes to two hours. Um, and that very much depended on the size of the VM. We were having some network issues when we initially started this. Um, we thought that we were running over our uh, 10 gig interfaces, but unfortunately due to uh, some switching configs and stuff like that, uh, we are actually only getting one uh, gig throughput. We resolved that, uh, made some changes, and uh, you know everything went a lot faster after that. But the time your VM takes will very much depend on the size of the hard drives. Um, while we were stuck at one gig, uh, we did a couple 500 um, gig migrations, and that took about five hours. Um, now, unfortunately, we did those things before we discovered our network issue. Um, now that we've resolved that, uh, we're interested to go back and do some of those bigger ones again and hope to uh, record a lot better speeds. Also, I know Neil's been adding more functionality to one swap and uh, increasing speeds that way as well. Um, as he talked about. So 
all of that's good stuff. Uh, we really had a lot of success here. Like I said, we ran three VMs in uh, parallel and ultimately finished the bulk of what we considered ready for migration, um, which was about 114 VMs. And we did that in about two weeks. Um, and things that we didn't do were some of our like net scaler load balance uh, type appliances, our Citrix environments and desktops, which ultimately will get um, redeployed because, you know, PBS uh, handles those things. So, you know, there, we didn't migrate everything. We didn't migrate some appliances. Those are going to get redeployed. But um, out of give or take our 150 servers, we did 114. So did the bulk of our environment and had a lot of success with it. Um, the integrations and the packs we used within the um, workflow above are listed out here and obviously are all open source as well as Stackstore.